Hello, this video is one of a series of lectures for the distance education course entitled Woody Landscape Plants, a component of the Prairie Horticulture Certificate Program. This video is the first lecture on the classification and naming of plants, a field commonly known as taxonomy. Classifying things really just means that you look around and you recognize characteristics of certain groups in common. So you look at objects and you find that they have similar characteristics. So that's the basis of classification. When it comes to classifying plants, it, it was no, noted that early civilizations were already doing this quite a bit. They were starting to recognize groups of plants that they could eat. So they were sort of classifying that way. Or certain plants that maybe were poisonous, so they had to avoid them. So they started to recognize and classify plants and animals as well at an early time. Now, as time went on, the classification of plants became more formalized so that the field of taxonomy, or sometimes known as systematics, the field were born. So things have become much more formalized since then. It should be noted that there is a need for a system of classification of plants and animals, for example, in order for us to be able to name and identify them. So we really have to have a system in order for it to make any sense. Otherwise, it's just rather random and haphazard. There's two major methods. One is for classifying plants. One is just to look at fairly uh, gross morphological characteristics. Morphological meaning structural, basically. And end use characteristics. We just look at those, and there's several ways you can see you know, we divide things into annuals and perennials, for example, where they grow one year or many years, or whether they're trees, shrubs, or vines, like the way the plants, the stature of the plants, or just their general size, or their shape, or even their use, whether they're for border plants, in the case of ornamentals, or we use them for hedges, or we use them for like street trees or specimen plants, and so on, or we can even classify plants according to the use of the plant, whether it be like a fruit or a vegetable, or maybe an ornamental plant. <coughs> But the more useful when it comes to identify plants is the whole notion of scientific classification. This is based on the whole idea that plants that are uh, have common ancestors have similar biochemistry, similar makeup, and they also look somewhat similar. They have some similar morphological characteristics in common. Uh, things like shape of the leaf or the way the leaves are arranged on the stem and the way the flowers look, the shape in them color them perhaps sometimes, but that's not so important because you can change that. But or the fruit structure, the cone structure. It should be noted that once the classification scheme is, is constructed that it's kind of hierarchical. You start out with a whole large group of plants, for example, that are very broad categories of plants. And then you can go down from there and you get finer and finer and more and more specific categories until you finally get down to the individual plant species, which we'll talk about. When we start at the top of the hierarchy, you can see that the plants can be loosely grouped into one of four major categories. Things like the algae, which you normally find in water, uh, fungi and bacteria, which are responsible for a lot of uh, diseases of plants and animals. Mosses and liverworts is another grouping. And of course, the big grouping that we're concerned about here are what are called vascular plants. <coughs> now, a vascular plant is one that has tissues that are specialized for conducting materials up and down the stem. Woody plants, of course, are particular vascular plants in that they have these specialized conducting cells, but these cells are also extra strong so they can support, help to support the large structure because woody plants have a large structure above ground that's there all year round. Now let's take a look at classification schemes. I want to. This isn't something that is important to know all these these names, but I just want to be able to explain how things kind of go from the the broad categories down to the more specific. The first category that we can uh, often we might encounter is what are called divisions, and certainly when it comes to horticultural plants in the landscape, most landscape plants come from two two divisions, and there are other ones, but these are the two that are the main ones. One is the division Coniferophyta. This is the one that contains all the conifers. Then there are over 500 of these that are mostly woody species. Things like cedars, junipers, pines, spruces. All those things are conifers, and we know they produce cones. They're all part of a group known as the gymnosperms, which have seeds that are they're born naked, as it's called. 
on the surface is scale, so they don't actually aren't enclosed. If you break open a cone over a, of a, in the fall, you can sort of shake the seeds sometimes right out of the right out of the cone because they're not enclosed. The other division that's important to us is what's called the magnoliophyta, and these are the angiosperms basically. These are the, the plants that are the true flowering plants that are, and the seeds are enclosed within an ovary. And there's something like 220,000 or more species of flowering plants. So there's lots of them. Now, for the classes, um, underneath the divisions, we have uh, the next order of magnitude or the most more, more refined classification, and we go down to what's called class. So under the conifera phyta, for example, we have a couple of classes that are particularly important to us. One is, and again, you don't need to know all these names, but this is important just to see how it works. Under the division conifera phyta is the class coniferopsida. And there are two orders under this class that are important to us. So you can see it goes division, then class, then the next down it gets a little more refined, which is the order. The coniferales has got the pine spruces and, and junipers and cedars. And we also have one that's called the order Taxales, which is related, but it's not as closely related as all those other ones, and it's, it has the U family. Now the Magnolia phyta, the angiosperms, which we talked about, has two major classes. One's called the Liliopsida, which are the monocotyledons. These are things like the grasses and the orchids, the palm trees, those kinds of things. Lilies are, are also in this group. In, or, in terms of ornamental horticulture, these are often the herbaceous species, very few woody species, and there's reasons for that. Uh, what's more important to us in terms of landscaping is the class Magnoliopsida, which contain, which is the, are the dicotyledons, and uh, I'm not going to let you look up the difference between monocot and dicot at this point if you're not already familiar with it from the botany course. But there's around 170,000 of these species, and about half of them are woody, and so they're very important to us in, in the um, vertical woody ornamental plant area. <coughs> now below the order is getting to be a fairly major important grouping when it comes to, to looking at woody ornamental plants. We start to see plants in these groups. Up to this point, there were similarities among the plants, but they weren't that much, they weren't that, that recognizable. When we get to the, the idea of a family, we start to see really similar characteristics for identifying them. They're, they're similar growth and, and morphology and, and other things. So they start to become a little more alike, although by no means would you necessarily know it from looking at them uh, at a cursory glance. But there are times when it does work rather well. For example, the maples are all part of the maple family. And uh, these are trees and shrubs that have opposite leaves, and they're usually simple and low. Now, those are things that we'll talk about in another video, if you're not familiar with them already. But they have certain characteristics in common. After you go down below the family, so we often talk about a lot of plants in the same family. We've got the rose family, we've got the maple family, we've got the dogwood family. So they always have the dogwoods and the maples. Now, the, 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 it doesn't always work that, you know, um, the rose family doesn't contain only roses, and we will talk about that later. <coughs> the next uh, level of classification below the, the family is the, what are called the, the gen our genera, which is the plural for genus. The genus is a very important, uh, we're getting down to very specific things now where they start to become quite recognizable. The genus allows grouping of species with very similar uh, characteristics. There's more similar characteristics than you'd see say in the family, so they're, they're quite a bit more in common. So you start to be able to recognize different species within the same genus, for example. They may look quite similar, such as the birches. They're all in the same genus, Betula, for example. So you see that. And below the genus, so the genus is really important because it's the genus becomes part of it later on when we talk about naming of plants, you'll see that the genus is part of the, of the plant name, the genus name. But the species, the whole notion of a species is really considered to be the only real entity in systematics, the only thing you can say for sure. The rest of them are, are somewhat arbitrary and subject to interpretation. And you'll see that the classification scheme that I've been discussing here is quite a bit, uh, you know, can be quite different depending what book you read. So that, again, it is rather subjective to some extent, although it's based on, still based on a lot of good information. <coughs> 
Species can be defined very explicitly, more explicitly than any other category. For example, one definition says that they're a group of individual plants that is fundamentally alike. Or it's a, another way to define it as one that uh, uh, all members of a species can freely interbreed with each other, whereas you can't between species. There is even a classification scheme below the species. So you may have a species, you know, say uh, something like uh, paper birch, or you might have uh, cottonwood, but you'll see that there are other, you can actually go a little bit further. And how this works is you may have a species that covers a large geographical range, but there are populations, of, you know, in different parts, say, of the country of, of the same species. And over time, these kind of evolve into having some specific, unique characteristics to that population. So when these things are significant enough, you can actually define the, uh, another category below the species level. Let's take a look at what I mean. Two of the ones that you'll see commonly are what's called a subspecies, which means it's again, abbreviated SSP period. They have several distinctive differences, but like, for example, eastern cottonwood and plains cottonwood are considered subspecies of the, of the, of the cottonwood. So they're, they're similar, they can interbreed, but they actually have a lot of differences if you look closely. And the variety, the botanical variety is another one, and this one is one where there's one to few differences. Sometimes it can only be one trait. Uh, for example, uh, there's the um, choke cherry var melanocarpa, which is the black fruited choke cherry. The variety melanocarpa tells you that it's got black fruit instead of red fruit. And in horticulture in particular, we also see variation as the basis of cultivars, which is the, the name cultivar is short for cultivated variety. And there's two major methods for obtaining cultivars. One is that you just select something from the wild and then you keep it in cultivation by cloning it, for example, by vegetatively propagating it. And a good example of this is one is uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper, Juniper scopulorum, the cultivar Medora. It was just selected from a what's a var botanical variety in the Badlands of North Dakota. So here it actually was a specific botan or, um, botanical variety that was made into a cultivar and then propagated, you know, clonally. So you got every individual is the same as the other one. This is like a population, this var columnaris that, that uh, has all somewhat similar characteristics, but they selected one out of it that they liked and they, they just propagated. Another one, another way to develop cultivars is by actually breeding and, and selection. For example, uh, the, the um, Drotmore basswood is Telia flavescens. You see this X in here means it's a cross between two species. And the, the cultivar named Drotmore. And this Drotmore basswood was selected by Frank Skinner uh, from a cross between two different uh, basswood types, Telia cordata, which is called little leaf linden, or little leaf basswood, I suppose, and Telia americana, which is our native basswood. So these were crossed, and then out of the crosses of all the offspring, he selected one that he really liked, and, and it looks something like this. And there it is. That's a nice plant, uh, quite used in the prairies. It's one of my favorites, actually, uh, a very nice plant. So that is the first lecture. The next lecture, uh, we'll talk some more about um, naming plants.